Good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Lachey in Dallas, Texas. Um, I met Steve Amatrano over 20 years ago. Um, he was uh, still uh, serving our country at the time up in uh, at Tinker Air Force Base uh, in uh, outside of Oklahoma City. Uh, I was impressed with Steve's modeling, uh, the fact that he was an SN3 guy. Uh, a bit of background on Steve is that after modeling the Boston and Maine Railroad in HO uh, for a period of time, Steve switched to SN3 after seeing PBL's advertisement uh, on the back of the Gazette, uh, and then a chance visit to Chama and Durango, and from then on, Steve was sold on modeling the Denver and Rio Grande in SN3. Steve found that operation and detail of SN3 locomotives and rolling stock was far superior, and still is in my opinion, uh, to anything in HO back in 1989. Uh, the layout you're going to see this evening is Steve's second layout. Uh, the first was torn down after Steve returned from uh, active duty in Okinawa. Uh, but while he was there, uh, he designed the current layout uh, remedying many of the shortfalls in both the operational construction design uh, of his first layout. The current layout was started uh, in the spring of 2001 uh, while Steve was stationed uh, at, uh, in Oklahoma. It is modular and fits in a small spare bedroom. Uh, and if uh, space was at a premium, uh, he can set up either uh, the Chama side or the Santa Fe side independently. Currently, the uh, layout sits in a finished uh, bedroom dedicated to the layout uh, in Steve's home in San Antonio. So if you would, um, make sure everybody but Steve uh, is muted. I'm going to run the slides from here in Dallas, and Steve's going to narrate uh, and then post your questions to the uh, chat box. So let me share uh, my screen here, and we'll start the presentation. And Steve, you well, thank you. Go? Hey, well, welcome everybody to the uh, San Antonio Chile line. Uh, the title picture shows uh, <clears throat> the C-16-278. Um, the station to the left is scratch built. I did, built that in Okinawa and uh, 278 a uh, year, many, many years ago, uh, took a trip to the floor and it took me many years to rebuild it, but it runs like a marble on glass. Next slide, Mark. So here we are, as I mentioned before, the uh, station to the left of the K-28 uh, has a full interior, built that in Japan. Uh, the transmission lines that you see behind the station, they're all scratch built. I use uh, little jeweler's beads to represent the insulators. And as we go through the slides, you'll see that a lot of the track and Santa Fe uh, has a lot of grass in it. So being a military family until Catherine and I retired, um, I had to design the layout so, I, so it could fit in a spare bedroom or as Mark mentioned, commodity was a space, was a problem. Uh, I could set up one thing or the other. Currently the table is four, uh, is four tables. I can jock him in with these. Um, the layout has been disassembled and reassembled twice. Um, it's very overbuilt, and I can tell you that. One of the things I did when I built all the bench work, prior to laying down any of the track, I put rice paper on the layout and then walked across it. If the rice paper crinkled or ripped, then I knew I had some problems. Um, the layout has been here since 2000. Three, and I have never had any warping or any, any issues with uh, the bench work or track work. And the layout is basically two geographic sections. You have the Chama, which is on the north side, and the Santa Fe on the south side. And the next slide, I believe, will be the uh, diagram of the layout. And you can see what I'm talking about. I can set up one side or the other if space is a commodity. All right, so here we are, as I mentioned before, um, I wanna incorporate some key uh, issues that uh, I came across when I was in Chama. First being is I really thought the 
run through engine house where they can come in one side and go out the other was, was very, very interesting. Um, and that was one of the things that, that uh, I did model on the Chama side. The next um, was the Santa Fe side. Um, got one of the books on Santa Fe. I can't remember the gentleman's name, uh, Dorman, I believe. And just that was, that was the cat's meow as far as what I wanted to model. Small operations, uh, laid back. Um, and again, one of the other things is no one was really modeling the Santa Fe. Everybody, you know, the mountainous regions. And I realized that I couldn't capture that, um, the layout that, with the guards, the size I had. Th therefore, it fell right into place. And as we go through the pictures, you'll see that both Santa Fe and the Chama have very distinctive uh, terrain features and, and colorizations, but they're all blended together. So works out really well. Um, as I mentioned before, um, couldn't get realistic grades in there. So therefore Santa Fe was it. Um, one of the things that I wanted to manage was ensuring that each, the most of the radiuses were 36 or greater. There's only one small section. It's only about three or four inches where it's 34 inches, but everything else is 36 inches or greater. And I've never had any issues with rolling stock or locomotives with those radiuses. Modeling Santa Fe uh, required a great deal of scratch building, which I really, really enjoy. Um, I can see a picture in a book or I can actually see a picture in the head, so to speak, I can draw it out pretty much the scale and then I can build it. The uh, backdrops that you'll see are all hand painted. Um, I keep them very muted. Um, they're not there to enhance the layout but not overtake the layout because that's why we have the trains out there. One of the things I did with the fascia is that it's all uh, rounded and all the screws are countersunk. So the, the terrain and the fascia all flow together. And I think it makes the layout look a lot better. So here we are. Here's a schematic of, of the layout to the north of Chama, to the south is, is Santa Fe. Um, it's a duck under. The layout tabletop is 50 inches high. The duck under is 50 inches. Um, you can see on the Chama side, the engine house, and we'll have some pictures of that coming up here shortly, where it's a run through with a 65 foot uh, turntable. And the, one of the other things that I wanted to model is the, as in Chama, the sand house and coal house, uh, coaling tower next to each other. And basically uh, you can see the dimensions inside the layout. And then when we go to the south side, um, you can access Santa Fe from inside the layout or outside, outside the layout. Um, and basically uh, a lot of street running in Santa Fe. Um, the track work, I've never had any issues with. Most of it is all flex track. And the reason for that is knowing that the layout had to be stored uh, in between military moves. Um, the plastic on the ties is not going to expand or contract. Therefore, the woodwork and the layout sits on home so it was sealed. Uh, but with the plastic ties that cut down any type of movement due to heat or in cold by one third, in my opinion. And all the table joints are uh, with the uh, uh, carriage bolts and the layouts are self level, the layout legs are self leveling. Next slide, Mark. So here we are, here's a overview of Chama. On the left side that you'll see is a small little yard there. And you can see the coaling tower and just beyond the coaling tower is the sand, uh, sand house. And you can see the engine house oh, to the very top of the picture where the track runs, runs through it. Uh, to your right top is a picture of the engine house. That was a kit from many, many years ago. Um, 
follow the directions, but I did do a full interior on it. It's all scratch built. I left the roof off because I spent a lot of time work on the interior and therefore wanted to show it off. Uh, the center lower picture shows uh, the 65 foot turntable. And that's a, uh, I believe an Overland's model OM uh, that I custom painted. It has ground lights. Uh, all the lights are battery powered. And uh, the rust that you see on the OM and the tender, that took over eight hours of airbrushing. Took a lot, a lot of time, but I think it turned out extremely well. Next slide, please. So here we are, here's the interior of the engine house. Uh, left side, you'll see the track that goes through. It has a inspection pit that is lit. And in low light, when a locomotive is parked on it, um, it's, it's a very, very dramatic picture. Unfortunately, just couldn't get a good picture to present here, but if you ever come over the house in real, real time, you'll see it literally looks good. And uh, here's the outside uh, picture to the right, uh, showing the detail. So, Mark? Yep, you ready to go? And yeah, we're good, Mark. And there we shows the uh, exterior of the engine house. And notice I modified the windows uh, to represent that they open up. Here's a picture of the coaling tower and the sand house. As I saw them in Chama, and I want to replicate that. Uh, both are PBL models. They all have uh, full lights and everything else like that. Um, the rocky structure that you see behind the sand house and the hudos, the, the uh, hudos between the uh, sand house and the coaling tower, that helped break up the loop effect of the railroad. Next slide, Mark. Mark? It should move. Okay, there we are. And here's another uh, unique feature that I wanted to incorporate in Chama is the ash pit. It's fully lit. It replicates hot ashes. Um, it again in low light is very very dramatic. And the things that I do, I do a lot of modification to the locomotives. With this is a uh, PBL K thirty six four eighty four. But you notice it has the uh, ground markers uh, underneath the cab and a lot of additional lighting inside. Thank you, Mark. And so you can see the background on the left side of the picture. Um, and again, it's very muted because I wanted the focus to be on the, the layout itself, the models. Um, one thing I did start to add is there's lots and lots of, of uh, floral colors in there, flowers, so to speak, um, hundreds of flower patches. And those are all been scratch built. And I think it, it just livens up the layout, gives it a little more um, life, so to speak, versus the drab colors that we see. Um, the picture to your right, um, that's the rock cut that cuts around behind Chama. The rocks are hydrocal, uh, the trees are super trees and the hudos um, are all handmade. And everything on the layout that you will see, if I ever have to move it from the rock castings or anything else like that, everything comes out. Um, and they all sit in place with pegs and wire and I can replace it within a matter of seconds. Next slide, Mark, please. And here's our last look at Chama. Uh, to the left top, you'll see uh, K28476. I've uh, custom painted that. Um, it's got the cold, colored herald on it. Um, that locomotive is, boy, I think I got that back in 1989 and it still runs flawlessly. Um, the picture lower center, kind of a lineup of locomotives there in Chama. And then the upper right picture shows uh, OM getting ready to be serviced to go out on the line 
along with the flowers that uh, breaks up the drab colors, as I mentioned before. Next slide, please. So we're done with trauma. Now we're going to move into Santa Fe. Um, I really, really enjoyed modeling Santa Fe because, again, at that time, no one was really modeling it. So uh, I just found different pictures. Um, just really, really enjoyed the ability of the flexibility of construction where no one else was doing it. Um, in Santa Fe, there's uh, two major street crossings. All the streets are styrene, airbrushed and detailed. Um, and the foliage represents a late fall. If you can remember the pictures in Chama, is more of a greenish color. This is more of a burnt autumn colors. And the way the layout is designed, it does require a great deal of thought to do all the switching. I really enjoy uh, slow speed operations and uh, to do it uh, correctly and efficiently. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. To the right picture, you'll see where the uh, train is pulled into the station. You can see the grass and the tracks and everything else like that. Um, and that's the station that was uh, scratch built behind the train when I was in Okinawa. Next slide, Mark, please. Here's an overview of Santa Fe, again, giving you a perspective. The train is at the station like this slide beforehand. Starting at the bottom, you'll see the top of the uh, water tank. There's a coal shed. Left of the coal shed is a pipe industry. Moving more to the center, of the picture, you see a, a white uh, structure. That's a farmer's co-op. That's all scratch built. Then we have the major street crossing there, moving on to the station. And then up at the upper top of the picture is the cold storage facility, TriStar Oil, and a uh, Hannah's Oil uh, Field Service facility. All. The, Pretty much everything that you see right there is all scratch built. Next slide, please. Mark. It's coming. There you go. So here's one of the unique things. This is Trinks Cafe. It's uh, kind of a, a family uh, thing with my wife, Catherine. Um, this structure is all scratch built. Um, and again, one of the unique things about being able to do what I wanted to create was you, that uh, I wasn't limited to uh, a set rule, so to speak, like building Ofer. Um, this building is made out of styrene and some of the uh, custom brickwork that I found, I can't remember what it is, but the tan, on the building is squadrons of white putty that they use to fill gaps and such. I thinned that out with acetone, then troweled it on. Then with the backside of a number 11 X-Acto blade, cut in the, uh, the cracks and everything else like that. And then I stained that with uh, water-based pigments, just smashing them in, um, on an old uh, uh, t-shirt and created that. The awnings are all brass that I've soldered together and that's real fabric on them. The tow truck is a, uh, boy, Mark, we picked, I picked that up one of the first few times I came up to Dallas. It was an old smashed up kit and I just kit bashed it. A lot of fun to do. And then the uh, picture on the right uh, shows the uh, some of the detail on Trinks Cafe. Next slide, please. Here's the backside that also is a team track on the Santa Fe side. 
Um, with regard to Trinks Cafe, somewhat difficult to see here, but the uh, the tar paper on there actually is rigid or has uh, a rise on it that I used uh, acrylics, paints, and a sirene to represent the tar that seals one piece to the other. The blue structure directly to the rear is made of styrene, and but that was also uh, stained uh, with pigments along with the fence. The other thing that you'll see left of the trash gone are cactuses. All the cactuses on the Santa Fe side have all been scratch built. And I came to the ability to build those. Um, we had a large cactus in the front of our house and doing yard work. I noticed that two of the cactus leaves that had fallen off and landed together almost looked like a heart, like a Valentine's type heart. And that's where I got the idea. So I got a Valentine heart confetti. And all I do is I cut them in half and then start gluing the pieces on uh, one by one. It's a little arduous to do. And then uh, once I have the cactus built to where I want, I'll reinforce it with some uh, super glue and then uh, paint them in a yellowish green along with some pigments. And what's really unique about it is no one cactus is, is identical. They all come out totally different. So I think it breaks up, uh, makes a unique train feature. The uh, trash gone is a start as a PBL idler gone. I bent the frame so somewhat it has a sway back and then the wood on the sides, um, I steamed them and then bent them into position. And so the car takes on a sway back and it's, it's a nice feature. A lot of people make comments on it. Next slide, please, Mark. So here we are, this is the biggest industry in Santa Fe. This is the Farmers Cold Storage Co-op. This is all styrene, it's all scratch built, has interior lighting. Um, as you can see, it is serviced by a covered uh, loading dock. It can also have vehicles that can load to the front. This structure, after I got it roughed in, um, I was wondering how I was going to finish it out. Um, I had already used uh, ballast on end scale ballast on one facility, and then I used the, as I mentioned before, the acetone and white squadron putty. And I was sitting in the train room and I was looking at the walls and their uh, air, I don't know what you call it, the airbrush stucco type finish. And I thought to myself, well, if they can do that in the real world, then I can do that in the model world. So what I did was, I uh, using Floquel paints, I mixed in baby powder, and it took a little bit of experimentation as far as how much thinner and how much air pressure, but that whole finish is paint mixed with baby powder that gives it that uh, nice, southwestern uh, finish to it and um, really really turned out well and what's really nice about that is um, it's a gap filler so if you have any gaps anything else like that it works out absolutely perfect and as you can see on the lower right side of the picture you can see the refrigerated car inside uh, and the water tank up top and just underneath the water tank the scratch built cooling tower. Next slide, Mark, please. Here we are, some uh, other pictures. Um, I built a little swing gate. It actually operates by your fingers uh, to represent whether or not the car is going to go in or go out. Um, the center picture shows the loading dock area. And as you can see, it's well lit. And right of the building is where tracks uh, go by the building. 
into a oil dock area, uh, oil farm, and kind of gives it a little bit of an urban feel to it. Next slide, please. And so we'll finish it, as I mentioned before, it has uh, uh, the baby powder mixed. As I said, it is a great gap filler. Um, you can see the swamp cooler on the roof. Um, one of the reasons that uh, this building is battery powered versus hardwired uh, to the other, uh, like the other structures are, is I have to be able to pull this uh, building off its for, uh, foundation to clean the tracks. So it made it, that made it just a lot easier to do. And it's got 1.5 volts in there with a good old D size battery. I, I don't think I've replaced the battery yet. Um, the roof uh, is uh, fine grit sandpaper. I found that worked out extremely easy to work with and very simple to use. Next slide, please. So with regards to uh, Santa Fe, um, if you have the ability to go back and look at the schematic of the layout, you notice has a lot of switching that goes on. And here we see uh, 474 it's pulled into the station. Um, as you can see, it's crossing one of the main roads. Um, none of the roads can be blocked in my mind's operation for more than 10 minutes. Therefore, the train has to be broken apart and that creates more uh, issues uh, and challenges for switching. Uh, the picture to the right, you'll see a three truck Heisler. Um, this uh, is PBL model. And this is one of the uh, locomotives that the fathers of Santa Fe decided to buy because they want to cut down on the uh, coal soot and hence being oil. So the Coal operated locomotives pull in, break the train down across the streets, pull out as soon as possible. Then the Heisler comes in and does all the switching. Kind of makes it a little interesting. And it really, um, those of you who do logging, you know it slows everything down and it's really, really enjoyable. Next slide, please. Well, let's see here. Did we go to the end? I, I got a black screen, Mark. Yeah, I do too. There we go. Yeah, uh, there we go. So again, I really appreciate the time that you spent here with me. Um, the door here in San Antonio is always open. And this picture here shows uh, 492 on its way home. That's a PBL caboose that uh, has been highly uh, modified and weathered. And uh, that's that's it, my friends. I really appreciate the time to be with y'all. All right, Steve, let me stop the share here. And then uh, I'm going to take a look at the chat and see. Um, all right, Phil Selinger, how did you apply the grass uh, within the ballast area and track? Uh, is it static grass? Yes, it is static. It is static grass. Okay, and and how did you apply it, Steve? Um, uh, a little bit of uh, diluted white glue, uh, Elmer's, dabbed it between the ties, and then uh, applied the static grass and the uh, applicator, and it worked out absolutely perfect. I have no issues with any conductivity with regard to uh, locomotives make contact with the rails and the grass. Okay. Here's a comment from Brian Bass. Beautiful layout. One of the, my, one of my favorites, uh, Barry Rozier, simply fantastic layout. Love the track plan. Um, one of the things we talked about, Steve, when um, uh, we were doing our rehearsal is um, you know, you you hung on to PBL uh, sound. Could you explain how you get it to run well uh, and, and why you still enjoy that? Well, first off, uh, I've uh, been in a combat career field 
for many, many years and my hearing is pretty much shot. But don't tell anybody, I can ignore my wife and it's documented. <laughs> anyway, I really enjoy the surround sound that PBL provides. With regard to that, um, just like in DCC, you, you, you have the speaker in locomotives. But what I do is I run the PBL foreground sound system through a amplifier, then a reverb and two large floor speakers. So it really gives me a nice surround sound uh, system. With regards to uh, keeping it uh, with flawless operations, um, I, I attack it on basically three different fronts. First off, I ensure the locomotives will run absolutely flawless. I can get those locomotives to run about one scale mile per hour. But the locomotive wheels have to be clean. The tenders are always the Achilles tendon with regards to conductivity. And when I clean the tracks, uh, I got it right here. The old uh, PBL used to sell them. It's um, <clears throat> not a bright boy, but it's, it's really, really good. But what I do is, if my finger represents the, the, the rail here, oh, let me get it here, uh, I go against the inside of the rail, not just on top of the rail, but if you look at how the wheels are designed, you have the tire and then the flange. And basically where the tire and the flange meet is where it meets the rail. And as such, that's pretty much where you're getting all your conductivity. Then, got it right here. CRC, electronic cleaner. I clean the rails off after I've buffed them out. And then I finish out with a 226. And after I do that, that layout will, I can let it idle for four or five months and it will work absolutely flawless. No static clicks or anything else like that. I can get the locomotives run through turnouts uh, and anywhere on the layout with no issues. Here's a question for you, Steve. Uh, are you using uh, 1.5 volt mini bulbs or uh, surface mount LEDs in your lighting on your engines? Uh, most of them are uh, 1.5. And then on some of them, I hooked up to an old transformer. And um, years ago I, in Japan, I found 8 volt, uh, 10 volt, 12 volt. And I just basically mix and match. And so when you look at some of the uh, structures that are powered by the transformer, each uh, facility has just a different uh, 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 brilliance of, of the lights. Okay. Then Sp Pete Smith wants to know about engine number two. Uh, he's curious, was that a Climax or was it, is it truly a Heisler? Okay. You're going to catch me short here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Oh, whatever PBL brought out, don't hurt me. Well, they've done them both, so you, you can you can claim either one. Yeah, the 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 Heislers were just uh, two trucks, so okay. I thought maybe you had found something strange because I kept looking at it. I think that was <laughs> a climax. Okay, you guys you guys are smarter than me on that one. All right, uh, another and here's Keith come back and says it was a climax. All right, and then Ron Gutman asked, please uh, repeat the names of the chemicals that you use to clean your uh, track, uh, the two CRC products. Would you sure. show those cans again? Uh, first off, if you need to, if the tracks have been idle for a long, long period of time, um, you want to get them nice and clean, get yourself a, a very, very fine type of uh, track cleaner, not a bright board. Um, that will just rip up your uh, uh, your rails and leave a lot of gouges in there where dirt will come in. So I polish them up with this. Then I'll take your CRC QD electric like cleaner on a on a old T-shirt with my finger, and then basically go down the rail and and clean those out. Once that's all done, the last thing I'll do is this helps preserve, I still can't figure this darn thing, computer out thing, uh, the uh, 2-26, and that creates uh, great conductivity. And 
I, I can literally, if I cleaned the layout today and did what I just did, I could walk in there in February and it will run just as smooth as it did today. Steve, one last question. Uh, would you talk about your, what I'll call your electrical preventive maintenance on your tenders, all the various things that you taught me to do years ago to uh, make sure you've got good conductivity? Okay. First off, the, the, the tenders, um, you know, when I first got the models, uh, I noticed that there was some issues with them. You really had to be, uh, have everything super clean. And, you know, this just makes sense. I mean, they had a lot of weight to them. So I kind of figured out exactly how the electric path goes from rail to the tender to the motor. One of the things I found that is in the tender, in the truck journals, a lot of them, the, the journals or the, the whole truck mechanism itself before the wheels were put on were painted in, inside and out. So you have paint inside the actual journal that is insulating the wheel axle, the end of the, uh, of the, uh, the axle. So um, once I found that, I just cleaned them out, reamed them out. And uh, basically when that axle rolls in that journal, it's, it's, it's metal on metal. There's no paint inside. Then if you follow how the, the path of electricity comes up into the tender, you'll notice that there is a screw, a spring, and then you have the bolster mechanism between the truck and the tender itself. I found that then um, just by happen chance when I was uh, working on a locomotive, I dropped the screw and the spring into some acetone just to clean it up. Um, and then I noticed that there was actually paint coming off it. So in some models, that screw and that um, spring, they must have painted. I don't ask me why, but I could actually see it flake off. And then of course, with regards to where the tender bolster uh, and the truck bolster mate, um, just polish shows up and you'll never have any issues ever again. Now, Steve, I recall you talking about using Jewelers Rouge in the journal boxes. Uh, yes. And you would take a paper towel and roll it up uh, into a cone-shaped um, swab, I'll call it. Um, is that, do I remember that correctly? Yeah. So with regards to getting the locomotives to operate extremely smooth, um, when, I, when I'll get a locomotive, I'll take it apart, I know, and it took me a long time to get the nerve to do this, but I'll get the, the boiler off it, and then I'll disassemble it to where I can look at, at the gears themselves. And then I will actually, with regard to, let's say, one gear to another gear, where they mesh together, I'll put a dot on, on them. And then I will take Jeweler's Rouge, which polishes your, your jewelry. And I'll just push it all into the uh, gearbox. And then I'll reassemble it and it oozes out the side and that's fine. And then I'll run the locomotive and it will run really, really hard uh, initially. But what that jeweler rouge is doing is it's actually polishing the gears and those gears will mesh to each other and then once I'm done with that, I'll take it all apart, clean the gears off, and remembering where those dots were, those gears will match, mesh in exactly how they were polished. And that's one of the techniques to get those locomotives to run extremely smooth. Very good. I don't see any other questions. Uh, last call for any other questions or comments. So. Uh, here are Mike Talkett's uh, commenting. I found the CRC 226 in my Home Depot electrical department. Uh, Keith says he found it uh, or bought it in Texas and uh, he can buy it from Granger's up in uh, Canada. So I think that uh, wraps it up, Steve. Thank you so much for your presentation.